God, hey, each and every one of you can send me scripture of the day. I will read all of them. I will receive for them. I appreciate that. But that, but that's like taking a, a, that's like taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C and not eating. That's like taking, you know, one one little vitamin supplement and say, you know, I don't I don't need to eat for at least a couple years. You're going to shrivel up and die. Now, before you shrivel up and die, you're going to shrivel up and get weak. If we're going to call our life, if we're going to call this year into existence, we have to know what this says. Now, I said all of that. Let's compartmentalize that. Now, let's begin. How's everyone doing this morning? Let's go into the Word of God. Romans chapter 4. Did I even tell you we're in Romans chapter 4? I thought I did. See, I, I got engrossed with what I was saying. Sometimes I just enjoy listening to myself. But anyway, that was a little humor there. Romans chapter 4. Thank you, Donna. God bless you. Romans chapter 4. There again, we're looking at this theme about calling your year, declaring. Last week from Job, decree a thing and it will be established unto you, right? Still under the, the theme of calling it. But specifically, notice what Romans chapter 4 says. We'll back up to verse 16. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. There is at least a year worth of Sunday teachings, but we have to go on so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, that it might be definite, positive to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Real quick, like this bottom line, what, what Paul is teaching right there. He's saying that, that Abraham, that the promise that God made to Abraham, we're going to look at that, more of that here in just a minute. The promise that God made to Abraham, going all the way back to Genesis, of course, when he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis 12, and then he really reiterated and he enlarged that promise in, in Genesis 15, 26, that we're going to look at here in just a second. That that promise is not just to those who are under the law, not referring to the Mosaic law, just referring to those pre-Christ, right? Okay? Because remember, you'll, you'll see the word, the word law and its usage several times in the New Testament. Sometimes that's why you need to know your Bible well enough. Is it referring to specifically the Mosaic law or is it referring to the Old Testament? Okay? So Paul is referring to the Old Testament here, right? So, because, you know, when he quotes from the, he said, in the law it is written with Samuel lips and other tongue will he speak to this people. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he's referring to the, one of the gifts of the Spirit of speaking in other tongues. Okay? But he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, but he said, in the law it is written. In Isaiah chapter 20. So there again, as, as a whole here, he's referring to the Old Testament. So Paul is referring to the Old Testament, not only those who are under the law, meaning who believe that Abraham was their father. Right? Because they, they were natural Jews or they became proselytes into the Jewish faith. Right? He said, so Abraham, you know, that promise wasn't to just the seed under the law, meaning that we would refer to as natural Jews. Right? That promise is also unto us because Abraham is the father of us all. Right? Old Testament saints, New Testament saints. Right? This promise that God made all the way back in Genesis 15, it covers both. Under the old covenant, now under the new covenant, which was based upon better promises. Everyone say amen to that. Amen. Somebody say, I like better promises. Amen. And God always keeps his promises. Amen. Amen. Abraham's father was all. As it is written, verse 17, I have made you a father of many nations. Now there again, now we're in Genesis 15, 26. In the presence of him whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things... I'm going to King James Version here. I love it how it's worded. And calls those things that are not as though they already were. And calls those things, King, New King James Version here, and this is real good too, though. I love it. And calls those things which do not exist as though they do. Your year doesn't exist yet. You can't wait on your year to show up and exist and then think something good's going to happen. You have to start calling, declaring, believing, faith projecting your year now so that you begin to walk into and step into the year that you want to have.
Life doesn't happen by accident. Good or bad, it does not happen by accident. Life does not happen by, well, maybe. Or let's see what happens. I'll tell you what will happen if you live the let's see what happens. Nothing. (laughs) Nothing that you want to happen definitely will not happen. As far as anything good, it won't happen. As far as anything productive, any kind of advancement in your life, any kind of enlargement in your life, it's not going to happen if you just wait and see what will happen. Because, see, many people who don't know their Bible well enough, they'll somehow misquote. They don't know where it's at. It's in the book of James where he says this. Do not say that we will go to, do, to such and such a place and do business, but let us say if God will. Now, let's apply hermeneutics. The scientific apl- application, that's what that word means, scientific application, there's another word with science, true science. True science always validates God's word. True science always substantiates God's word. Now, to make it real clear, we don't need true science to validate God's word. God's word validates his word. God validates his word. God substantiates his word. We don't, we don't need even true science to do that, right? Such as this. Columbus... Columbus, I could trail off on that, but I won't. Columbus, you know, he's been blamed for, yeah, anyway. Columbus was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. And by faith, he believed that. And also, there, 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 were, some, there were some discoverers before him reading their charts, their graphs. And also because at that given time, you could only find the, the Bible in Latin. And he could need to say he could read Latin very thoroughly. And he came across, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, he came across this scripture because he read his Bible daily. He came across a scripture that said that God says, I am he that sets upon the circle of the world. Now, in the Latin, the word actually is sphere. Spheres aren't flat. Spheres meaning globe, round, as in ball basketball. I mean, you got the picture, right? So Columbus, by faith, he believed that if I keep sailing, I will not drop off the edge of the world. Because I believe, according to God's word, that God made this world round. Because if he made it flat, it's not all that big. Because you can see the end of it. Oh, my, my, my. That'll put some faith in you. God made it to where when you think you've reached the end of it, you can continue to go. Now, he didn't fully understand gravity and the laws of it and all that because Sir Isaac Newton hadn't got a lot of input yet and all that kind of stuff. But he believed that there was still some kind of gravitational pull, even though he didn't know the phrase, that as he continued to sail around the the sphere of the world, that he would not fall off of it because he knew the world was round. And if God made the world, if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the book of Psalms declares that I believe there are things under it that when I'm under it, I'll still be upright. Toilets will flush the different direction, but I'll still be upright. You got that. But anyway, so so he understood all of that. How? By faith. Put him light years ahead of conventional wisdom. See, there again, true science always will substantiate God's word, even though God doesn't need that. And that's why when I've said this for decades, if you will stay with God's word, you'll always be ahead of conventional wisdom. You'll be ahead of the crown. You'll be ahead of what people say, what people think, what people believe or don't believe. What does it matter what they believe or don't believe? All that matters is what do you believe that God said? You start living a life like that and you start calling your year into existence, you are going to have the best year of your life up to this point. Somebody say, amen, I'm so glad I came out today. Oh, where is the time going already? But anyway, there again, this is the God that you serve. He calls those things that are not as though they already were. He does that in your life. And if you listen close enough, especially, that's one of the reasons why you need to read. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. One of the things that, that 
you will have more faith in as you're reading it. God, God's calling you. Every time you read it, he's calling you. Every time you read it, you're, you're blessed. He's calling you. He's calling you into blessing. Every time you read that you're the head, not the tail, he's calling you into that place of authority. Every time you read that he loves you with an everlasting love, you realize even though I, I fail every now and then and make mistakes, that his love, his love is greater than my blunders. Every time you read that his mercy is renewed every morning, he's calling you into new mercy. He's calling you. You know, Paul even deals with that in, in, in the book of Hebrews. He said, you know, today, today, don't harden your heart as in the day of the provocation. Don't harden your heart. But he said, today, if you will listen, God is calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you what you actually are instead of what you are maybe currently. He's calling you into another realm of your life where you currently aren't. He's calling you into hope when you could be hopeless. He's calling you into peace when you could be in turmoil. He's calling you into prosperity when you're flat broke. He's calling you into something so much bigger and better than your current existence. But we need to listen. Listen to his voice. Listen to what he's calling us. If God does that and we are his children, shouldn't we do what he does? It's not a loaded question. It's a very simple question, very basic question. I know you know this, but you know, the word Christian just simply means a follower of Christ. It's simple, it's very simple, and yet it's very profound. It means a follower of Christ, a Christian. You know, you know initially in the book of Acts, you'll see where it's used of, of Christians. It, it was a dismissive, derisive, uh, derisive term, is that it was a very demeaning term, is that they called themselves Christian. So the people in that given city, Antioch, and then, of course, throughout the surrounding region even, they did that in a very condescending way. And the, and the world still does that today, if you notice. So don't, it's all right. It's been going around for a couple thousand years. But anyway, it just simply means I'm, I'm a follower. I'm an imitator is really what it means fully, an imitator of Christ. That's so why when Paul says, be followers of me as I am of Christ, that word follower, it, it's imitator in the Greek language. So he's saying, listen, I, I do my best to imitate Christ. Now, now, as long as I'm following and imitating him, you need to follow and imitate him as I'm doing it. Now, if I stop that, you need to stop that too. Stop following me. Simple as that. Someone, oh, uh, no, let me say focus. Let me say focus here. See, this, this is what happens. This is what happens when you read too much of God's word. I said too much in humor and jest. But anyway, see, it's one of the reasons I don't need notes. Why in the world does somebody need notes to deliver God's word? Because we don't want to hear what you have to say that you wrote down. We want to hear what the Spirit of God has to say through you that he has filled you up. Okay, just a personal issue of mine. Anyway, let's go back to the yes. You know what? Go with me over, over to, uh, let's do this. Didn't really plan on doing this, but let's do this. Let's kick it up a little bit. Genesis chapter 17. Watch this. Now, there again, God is the one who sets the example, and we just want to imitate him, correct? Okay? Two of us do. We just want to imitate God, right? Amen. Amen. We just want to follow after God. We want to mimic. It even means that. It means to mimic God. So that's why Paul is saying that in Romans chapter 4. This is God. This is the faith of God. Is that? Jesus even told us, of course, in the book of Mark, is that, hey, listen, have faith in God. Literally, I know you know that's what it means, but it means have the faith of God. Imitate his faith. Mimic his faith. We're followers of Christ. We're followers of God. We're his children. You ever notice that? I'm really noticing that. It kind of, not that you forget it, but you know, you're not in it. But I mean, when our children were young, man, you better, better watch what you say and do because they will pick it up 
and they will imitate you. And then you turn around and scold them, and then they say, well, you said that, or you did that. And then you got to repent to the Lord and to them. I tell you, nothing like repenting to a three-year-old that will humble you for life. But anyway, I tell you what, I tell you. But anyway, our, 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 wonderful, Miss, our wonderful grandson, Mr. Wonderful, he's already just a little over one. Of course, he's a genius, and I know your grandchildren are too. He, he, he's, a, he's a bona fide genius. It, 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 it's self-evident. But anyway, um, he already, he already imitates. He's fascinated by a phone. He will get his mama's phone. Now, he's trying to get mine, but he starts chewing on it because he never sees me hardly on it. And he, so he says, I guess I can eat this. But anyway, and, um, and he literally knows. You got to push a code in to open it up. And then he knows, because she'll open it for him sometimes. Then he knows he just used his finger because he knows if you kind of do this, somehow something's going to happen. Now, that is a, a one year old, three week, one year, three week old baby that's imitating what he's seeing. Now, most of us have been saved longer than one year and three weeks. And we still ain't imitating God. We still ain't, for a, a point here, we still ain't imitating Jesus. When all the time he's showing us stuff, speaking, speaking, and we still don't imitate his speech. We still don't imitate what he says most of the time. Look at this. This will get you excited now. Now, now you'll like me more. Watch this. Genesis chapter 7. Genesis, excuse me, Genesis chapter 17. Um, back to that because there again, God calls those things that are not as though they were. God calls those things which do not exist as though they already did. See, before you got saved, God already called you saved. Before you got saved, God called you saved. Before you got saved, he called you his own. Before you got saved, he called you his child. Before you got saved, he called you by his love. Long before you even got saved and I got saved, he was calling us by name. Look at this real quick like Genesis 17. Oh, we, oh there's so much time. Uh, we need to go. Let's just drop down to, oh, I want to read so much here. Um, let's go, oh, how much time are you guys willing? Uh, Deacon Siegel, when does that game start? <laughs> so, <laughs> look at this. I heard what you, somebody said. I'm just ignoring it. Okay. Look at this. Because of time. I'll be sensitive to you, to you guys who are still addicted to, but no. 17 verse 3. 70 verse 3. Okay. Are we there? Just 70 verse 3. Then Abram. Oh, you already know where I'm going with this, don't you? Then Abram, oh, I wonder, I want to read actually some of the latter portion of this scripture, uh, this chapter before I got here and really set it up more. But anyway, we, we can't. And Abram fell on his face and God called him. Some versions read actually. God called him and talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be well, there's a word right before that. No longer shall your name be. No longer shall your name be called. See, remember, and I know I've taught on this. You know this even well. But one of the reasons why parents would wait a long time, sometimes years in the Old Testament, before they named their child. Sometimes it was while they were still in their mother's womb because they got a word from God or an angel visited and said, here's what you're going to name your child and here's why. 
But sometimes it went years. Sometimes at the moment of birth. That's, that's why, that's why uh, uh, Esau, oh, my, my, my. We, eh. That's why, that's why, and, and also I could go into all their names even. And also Jacob, the reason, one of the reasons why Jacob was named what he was named is at birth is because he, was, he supplanted being even born, brought into this world. So I said, you know what? Your name's Jacob. You're a supplanter. We'll look at more of that here in a minute. But many times it would take a long time. Sometimes, study the Bible close enough, Old Testament, their parents would give them a name, and then something would happen in their life or in the life of their parents to give them greater revelation, and the parents would change their name. Why? Because, because in that culture, in that day and time, still to this day, in especially Hasidic Jewish culture, they pick a name with divine purpose. That name represented God in them. It represented something about them. God's hand, handiwork, God's destiny, God's plan for their life. So notice this. Now, Abram, initially called Abram, which means a distinguished father. Nothing wrong with that. Some say exalted father. That's kind of picking up too much. Distinguished father, distinguished man, respected all of that, overall honorable man, right? Now, then God says here, Abram, you know what? Um, I've waited to this point in your life to bring you to this level. I'm not going to call you Abram anymore. I'm going to call you what? Abraham. Because Abraham, tell us what it means. Abraham means what? Among many things, it means father of many nations. Now it actually means exalted father by God. It means father among many nations, father progenitor, blessing. It also means father within covenant. See, that's why when you continue to read even the New Testament, when it, when it says that you know, he, he's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's a God of Abraham because he's a God of all covenant. It was a covenant that Abraham made that we're enjoying today. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, Paul teaches that very clearly, explicitly, that it was the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15. Isn't that interesting? God, you know, Abraham was in covenant, full-fledged covenant, but several years went by. Several years went by. That's a test. Tell me next week how many years went by from the time he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees until now we get to uh, chapter 17. Do not dare Google that, <laughs> at least not in my presence. But anyway, so now we're in chapter 17. Several years have gone by, and now God says, okay, you've been walking my covenant, but listen, I, I, I've been holding on to this one. I'm calling you to a greater place. And it's going to begin by calling you something that I haven't called you before. See, some of you have never called your year before. Some of you have never called your destiny before. Some of you have never called your breakthrough before. Some of you have never called blessing and relationship with God. You, you haven't truly called that enough. So God said, from now on, this is no more will I ever call you Abram. From now on, I will call you Abraham, that you will be the father of many nations. You will be the father of this covenant that I've blessed you with that will, that will extend into millenniums. Because our God is the God of Abraham, and he's the God of all covenant. He's the God of Isaac because he's the God of promise. And he's the God of Jacob because he is the God of all grace. Let's just look at that real quick. We know that. You can read it another time. It's in um, Genesis chapter 32. Is that this guy named Jacob, there again, his name meant supplanter. Because remember, he was holding on to the heel of his brother. What was his brother's name? I said it earlier. Esau, when he, when he was delivered. So the midwife, you know, you know she sees, okay, here, oh, here, we knew you have twins. Here's one. Okay, wait, here's another one grabbing on to the heel, grabbing on to the ankle of the one that's coming out. Well, he basically supplanted his delivery. He basically was born with a deceptive heart. Jacob isn't a good name. What's your name? Deceiver. That's what Jacob means. It means deceiver, one of deception. It means, you know, it also, it means one prone to lying. One prone to ripping you off. 
One, one who is prone to playing you. One who's prone to working you. Jacob was the original player. And as we know, players only love you when they're playing. And the thing about players, they're always playing. Try to reconcile this. I, I, I need at least eight weeks just for Jacob alone, just on this issue about Jacob. Try to reconcile this. Jacob, he's full of deception. He's full of deceit. He, he's one that has a supplanting spirit, meaning uh, the, the best uh, synonym for that word supplanter would be he's an opportunist, meaning, meaning actually he will exploit you to op- bring opportunity to himself, okay? So anyway, I mean, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of character is. And you, can I just blow you away here for a moment? And God says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now, now i got to define the word hate. I ain't got time for that. But anyway, in that usage there. But anyway, let's, let's keep moving here. Try to wrap your theological brain around that. All of those years that Jacob deceived, he deceived to get the birthright. He lied to his daddy in his dying days who is blind. Changed his voice even. Put on, put on a hairy coat. Yeah, Dad, that's me. Esau, is that you? Yeah, Daddy. Um, love you, Daddy. But anyway, Daddy, do the roar. But anyway, I shouldn't do that. But anyway, so, I mean, look at this. Have you ever really thought about this? Isaac is blind. Isaac is, you know, he did live a few more decades. Uh, by, by a miracle, God kept him alive so Jacob could reconcile. And, and, anyway, so he's, he's virtually on his deathbed. He's blind, incapacitated, and his son is lying to him. Now, freeze frame on that. That does not give you a license to lie to your daddy or mama. That was a mixed response. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to put on my psychologist hat there, and I'm trying to analyze that one. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, but anyway, i got to keep going here. So, I mean, that's the kind of person that Jacob was. And yet the whole time, God keeps dealing with him. Here's why the Holy Spirit's bringing that to light, why I just realized. Don't you ever... Don't you ever, don't you ever judge and discard someone who still has a lot of issues in their life, but at least they're trying to serve God. If they show up, they might have got drunk and high the night before, but if they show up on a Sunday morning, don't you dare, don't you ever dare Don't you ever dare pass judgment on them. God will judge you and bless them. My God, that's a sermon right there. My God, that's a sermon. Don't you ever do that to somebody. Because they're a Jacob getting ready to be called something else. You know the rest of the story. Took a few more decades to what I mentioned that point there. Jacob even had to flee for his life. Esau said, I'm killing him. When I find him, you know, all that's in the Bible. When I'm finding him, I'm killing him. The Bible, the Bible is the greatest read you could ever do, and Christians still don't do it. You know, since, since especially the, the invention, the advancement uh, of the printed press, Gutenberg Press, you know, that, that's why he invented that. God gave him that witty invention called the printing press, Gutenberg Press. You know why? He, he wasn't printing the New York Times on it because he knew that was garbage and full of lies. He wasn't printing any of that. He wasn't printing anything like that or L.A. Times or Fe- what's the local rag here? Phoenix Gazette, is it, or Arizona Republic? Phoenix Gazette went out. Arizona Republic will too eventually. But anyway, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't printing that liberal trash. Full of, full of lies and stuff. He had a heart 
to print the Word of God. God gave him a witty invention to print Bibles. Bibles going to mass production. They begin to flood Europe, 15th century, 16th century. Man, then eventually there's Bibles everywhere in Europe. People are reading everywhere. Wonder why, wonder why the Protestant Reformation, the epicenter was there in Europe. Wonder why. But anyway, um, back, back to this. Here, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is that when you, when you really read the word of God, you begin to understand that God's calling me into something bigger and better. God's continually calling, but I got to read it. There's so much in there. So a few decades pass, and then let me get back to this. A few decades pass, and, um, and, and, and uh, Jacob had a couple of encounters with God. And then he still has a couple of issues, though, with his father-in-law. You know, just a couple of things here and there. He's still got a thread. Here, here's the thing, though. Every time he had an encounter with God, there was less of Jacob and more of God. See, every time someone who's struggling... But at least they want to do good. They're trying to do good. I read Romans chapter 7. That, that, that you discover this, is that every encounter they have with God, it gets them that much closer where they need to be. See, so don't think, here's the most Christian thing. Don't think they're going back. You can't go back to the point where God brought you to. You can't, because see, when he does this in your life, you can't ever become that again. You may do that again, but you can't become that again. And that's the difference. It's called grace. You, you can't. See, David never committed adultery again because it wasn't in him. He did it, but he didn't go back to it. You see the difference? Yes, he was rebuked by Nathan the prophet. Yes, he suffered the consequences. All of that and all that. God cleaned it up. Bam, bam, blessed him and all that. Eventually, right? All that, absolutely, right? Aren't you glad God can clean up our mess-ups, right? So we understand all of that, but let me stay focused now. Back, back to Jacob. You guys catching all this? Back to Jacob is that he, he didn't regress. Now, he didn't, he didn't reach the place where he should have been maybe by that time, but he, didn't, he never became what he used to was. How's that? We, we got that one at least, right? He never went back to what he used to be like. Now, there was still, because every time you have an encounter with God, there's more of God that comes in you and less of you. And you get to the place where eventually, Genesis chapter 32, that's where it all began. He's wrestling for his life because he has to meet Esau the next day. He knew, and, and you really said that fully. You understand, this is what Jacob did when he divided, you know, his... his his wives, he divided company, he divided assets. That's what he did. He was said, okay, listen, listen, if Esau kills him, which he said he's going to, and people then, when they, when they spoke something like that, it doesn't deal. Because if you went back on your word, even though you said you're going to kill somebody, if you went back on your word, you were a covenant breaker. Yeah. I know. Anyway, so he knew. He said, you know what? I'm dead. Um, I'm not even going to fight him. I'm not even going to fight back because, you know, he's right. So anyway, this is like his last will and testament. He splits everything. He splits his assets up. Bam, bam, bam. You go this way. You go that way. If I don't come back, do this, do that. Bam, bam, bam. He's, he's saying goodbye because he knows I'm done. So that night, he had an encounter with God. Kind of interesting. We get to the place that we think, and it seems like we have no place to go. Isn't it interesting that that's when you get serious with God? But anyway, so the struggle begins. He's wrestling with the Lord. They ain't, you know, don't have time to go into all of that. God says, what is your name? Now, God knew his name. God knew his name before he was born. He, but he asked him, what is your name? And he said, you know my name, but Jacob. Then God says this, no more. No more shall your name be called Jacob. No more will you be called that. No more will people speak that over you. No more will I ever speak that over you. 
No more will you be called Jacob. See, some of you, some of you have had a lot of Jacob years. I'm not saying because issues in your life that, you know, moral issues. I'm just saying that the enemy has thrown all kind of deception at you. He's thrown so much junk at you and messed you up and messed your life up in different ways. And what has happened is that people are calling you a Jacob spiritually. And God says, no more will you be called that. Somebody say, no more, no more. will I be called that. Then God goes on to say in the next stanza, but you shall be called Israel. What does Israel mean? Oh, the full definition? Profound. You know, most people say, well, it means a prince of God, prince with God. And it does. It absolutely does mean that. It also means this. It means one who has wrestled slash struggled and overcome. Meaning, today we would say, one who has gone through a lot of stuff. One who has had the life knocked out of them. One who has had their heart broken into a billion pieces. One who lost all of their fortune, lost all of their standing in life. One who lost everything. And they were stripped to nothing but themselves. But they prevailed through it all. And they came out on top. That's what Israel means. And he said, from now on, you'll be called Israel because you've gone through so much stuff, but you prevailed. You stayed the course. You stuck it out. You repented. You got it right. You made a commitment to me and a covenant to me. I've seen your heart. I've seen your tears. I know you're sorry for what you've done. God said, you know what? Now you're still standing. I will make you a prince because you prevailed over all the stuff that life dealt you. And you're still going. You're still going strong. Little side note on this, just a little bit of biblical trivia for what it's worth. You know, you, know, you know, from that point right there, Genesis 32, through the rest of your Bible, the word Israel is mentioned 2,575 times in the King James Version. You find it 2,000 from Genesis 32 all the way through Revelation, you know, when you do see Israel mentioned, right? 2,575 times in your Bible. How many times do you see Jacob mentioned? Don't Google that one in my presence either. You get the point, though. The word Jacob is rarely mentioned. I mean, it still is. I'm not taking that away. But Israel, 2,575 times. God is calling you into something so much greater than your past. But today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your heart as in the day of the provocation, listen to what he's calling you. And he wants you to imitate what he's calling you, what he's calling you into. This year, he's waiting on you to start imitating, calling out what he has in store for you. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.